Stop working Even when I don't see it It's working 
lift our God up. You guys can be seated. Who is the most beautiful woman in the world? Wait, guys, before you answer that, don't say it out loud. Unless you're going to say your wife or your girlfriend. Who's the most beautiful woman in the world? I would guess if I did get vocal responses, it would probably be as many as there are people in the room. We all have different standards. As the old saying goes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But not only do individuals see beauty differently, whole cultures do. Think about that. Different standards for beauty all over the world. According to surveys, the ideal American beauty is skinny, blonde, has blue eyes, a, full, a small nose, and a full mouth. Canadians also believe that thin women are beautiful, but for different reasons. They assume her to be fit, healthy, and richer as she can afford good quality food. Brazilians give a lot of importance to toned bodies. Women are encouraged to work out and get sculpting massages on a regular basis. Chinese and Japanese folks have... Uh, they have a particular uh, attraction to the skin. They give a lot of importance to the skin. Women are considered beautiful only if they have smooth, flawless, and milky skin. Their skin care regime is extremely rigorous. Spa treatment's not an option. Massages are not just occasional, but a very important part of their beauty ritual. They even shave their faces every day to exfoliate their skin. As far as hair goes, if you have curly hair, uh, they give you every encouragement if you want to be considered attractive to straighten your hair. Long, straight, silky hair is their standard for beauty. On the other hand, in Africa, big is beautiful. Since most countries have a scarcity of food, a woman that's bigger is considered prettier than a skinny one. In fact, thin women are pitied and don't find husbands easily. Obesity is considered a sign of wealth in most African countries. So much so that young girls are force-fed oily food and camel milk in countries like Mauritania to prepare them for their wedding. Girls are sent to special camps where they are fed like cattle. The bizarre beauty standards in some places. In southern Ethiopia, scars are considered a sign of beauty. In fact, a girl is considered suitable for marriage only if she has enough scars on her stomach. The skin on the stomach is cut purposely starting from a very young age to ensure that she gets lots of scars. In New Zealand, on the other hand, Maori women have to tattoo their lips blue to be considered attractive. They even have tattoos on their chins. In some groups in South America and Africa, women wear lip plates that stretch their lower lips to extreme sizes. These plates are huge and they're made of wood. The girls start using these plates from a very young age as the skin is very flexible then. Once the lip is stretched to the desired size, they remove the plate and wear it very carefully and occasionally. A slender and graceful neck looks very alluring, but does not mean you should look like a giraffe. In certain cultures in Africa, women start wearing brass rings on their necks from a very young age. Rings are added as they grow older. These rings push down the collarbone and make the neck look very long and slender. A woman is considered to be ready for marriage after she has a sufficiently long neck. Surely there are lots of different standards for beauty and it may be makes you uh, like it that you are born here with some of those practices. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, both for individuals and cultures. You might guess that the Bible has a different standard. The ideal woman is described in Proverbs chapter 31, and it concludes with verse 30, which says, Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So that tells us what we're going to explore today. Uh, so oftentimes, our human tendency, our individual, our even cultural tendency is to focus on the outside. All of those attributes I read to you from the different cultures, they were all external qualities weren't they all external characteristics that is dangerous because outward beauty only lasts so long and even more it has some negative characteristics and consequences does itself Halle Berry in an interview said beauty 
Let me tell you something. Being thought of a beautiful woman has caused me great heartache, great trouble. Love has been difficult. Beauty is essentially meaningless and is always transitory. She's on to something. That if we focus on the outward appearance, try hard as we might, that we are fighting a losing battle. Because over time, everybody's looks fade on the outside. But we've come to our point in the study of First Peter where uh, Peter turns his attention toward marriage. For the next two weeks, today and next week, I'm going to be talking about marriage, Christian marriage. In verses 1 through 6, he has advice to Christian wives. In verse 7, he has advice for husbands. I guess that must mean a great marriage must come easier to men than women. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. The first verses, uh, those six verses are, attract, are, are uh, given to women because uh, there's a very specific question that's answered. In a marriage that is unequally yoked, in a marriage where there is a Christian wife and a husband who's not so serious about spiritual things, maybe even resistant to Christian faith, how should she live? How should she uh, work in that marriage, live in that marriage to make it the best it can be? How can she perhaps even bring a good witness and bring her husband closer to Christ? That's the question that is answered in these six verses. And I can tell you it boils down to two words, inner beauty, contrasted with what we typically focus most of our attention on, outward appearance. Inner beauty is what we're going to talk about today. This is verses uh, 1 through 6 of First Peter 3. But before we get there, I want to say to you, though, those of you who are single, uh, remember what 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says as you date. It says to not be unequally yoked with non-believers. If Christian faith is important to you, then that should be a priority. It should be a prerequisite for anyone that you date, that they also have a Christian faith, that they also consider their faith in Christ seriously. But if you're not in that situation, you're not single, but you're married, and maybe if now you have a stronger uh, faith than your husband, and listen, uh, the great thing about what I'm teaching today is this doesn't apply to marriage. The great thing I'm teaching is that inner beauty can be developed by women or men, married or not. But it especially applies to those who are in a partnership where one considers faith important and another doesn't. So let's talk about the power of inner beauty. Let's talk about the power of inner beauty. Verses 1 and 2 say, Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in what it teaches, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. There's both a negative teaching and a positive one here. Maybe you don't see it, these words, but I'll break it down where it's more memorable. It first says, wives, if your husband doesn't think faith's important, don't nag. Don't nag. That's what it says. Who of us likes to be nagged? I will tell you, some of us, I don't know how many, but a lot of us are like me. If you nag me, I'm going to do the opposite. And it comes naturally, really, when you come to Christ and you get excited about faith, when you see the difference that spiritual faith can make in your life, it's, it's natural for you to want to share it with everyone, including the person you're married to. But we can be so verbal, we can be so talking about our faith in Christ and everything all the time that can have the opposite effect. That's what he's saying here. He's saying instead of nagging, let your nonverbal communication have an effect, an influence. Let your nonverbal witness be what you concentrate on. I want to ask you a question. What is the most powerful nonverbal witness or testimony you've ever witnessed? The most powerful nonverbal communication that you've ever seen have an effect on others. I'll tell you, it's not necessarily a, a Christian testimony, but I, I think of a video I watched uh, a few years ago 
that showed a bunch of special Olympic athletes in a 60-yard dash. They all gathered to the starting line. All of these folks had special needs. They gathered and the, the gun went off and they started running. And a little girl fell and she rolled over and she just started crying. And the other contestants, they heard her, her cries. And one by one they stopped. And then they turned around and walked back to her. And they hugged her. And one kissed her. And then they grabbed and held hands and went across the finish line together. It tells you a lot more than millions of words ever would about compassion, about love. Peter says, instead of focusing on your words, you work on developing purity and reverence in your life. You seek to live out your Christian faith the best you can. That's going to have the most potential for helping your spouse, your husband, or your wife come to Christ. Now, I'll tell you, Northside is unusual. The churches I served for came here. Uh, on the average Sunday, it was probably two-thirds or, or three-fourths female. The guys were hunting or fishing or playing golf or doing whatever. Here, it's always been different. It's more like 50-50. In fact, I know some uh, husbands here, they come and are more attentive they're more involved than their wives are. And so it goes both ways. And I say this, it also goes to your witness to your fellow classmates or your coworkers, or your children or your parents. Focus not on what you say, but living it the best you can. And let me say to you, this is a principle. It's not a promise. Those folks, that husband, he has to decide to accept Christ himself. You, you can't force him even if your nonverbal witness is the best it can be it he has to make that choice you can't make it for him but make no mistake Peter's advice is to focus on living your faith and then you'll be ready to give that verbal testimony let's talk next about the value of inner beauty the value of inner beauty it's verses three and four your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. You know, I probably have 15 Bibles in my office, uh, different English versions. I like to look at different verses in different English translations, as well as in the Greek or the Hebrew, depending on New or Old Testament. These verses in the contemporary English version read, don't depend on things like fancy hairdos or gold jewelry or expensive clothes to make you look beautiful. Man, if we listened to this, it'd be bad news for Amazon and the malls, wouldn't it? Be beautiful in your heart by being gentle and quiet. This kind of beauty will last, and God considers it very special. From the New Living Translation, don't be concerned about the outward beauty that depends on fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should be known for the beauty that comes from within, inner beauty. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is so precious to God. How many things don't fade? But he's exactly right. You focus on the outward beauty, and believe me, we do in America. That's why all the ads are there to convince you to buy this thing that will make you beautiful or handsome. <laughs> it's why we have uh, so much attention given and so many people opt to go under the knife to fix themselves externally. In 2017, over 17 million plastic surgery procedures. Focus on that outward beauty, but do what you can. It fades. It has to be attended to constantly. That's why there's so many beauty salons and barbershops. Your hair keeps growing. Women go and have a permanent, but it's not really permanent, is it? Because they got to get another one. Why are there so many nail salons? Because folks want to get manis and petties. You know, I was at a restaurant the other day. Uh, this girl, had, she had extensions on her fingernail, probably that long. And she's dishing out burgers and nuggets. I uh, wonder how long those nails were going to last. But what happens? Nails, no matter how beautiful they are, they polish. Or they polish chips that you have to get them done again. This outward appearance takes constant attention. And even more, as I said earlier, it's a losing battle. One day it will fade. But what 
Peter says is this inner quality. You focus on growing your spirit. This can be the most beautiful, the very last day that you live. You look at the women's magazines. They're over and over about this. It says amazing buy, those on the covers to get you to buy the magazine. Amazing body makeovers. Try the winning plan. Want younger looking skin in 14 days? How about reducing lines nearly 50% in two weeks? Expert tips and makeover tricks to get your best look now. Now, at this point, I need to issue a disclaimer and maybe a clarification. I don't, I'm not against folks that work in the hair industry or the nail industry. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't pay any attention to your outward appearance. Uh, the desire for outward beauty is neither wrong nor unnatural. Everything God creates has its own sort of beauty. The word translated, adorm, translated adornment here comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means an orderly arrangement, which we get, from which we get the English word cosmetics. God gave us the inner desire for beauty, design, and order in nature. There's nothing wrong with working on our appearance. Just know that it is secondary and it is temporary. Far more lasting, far more important is your inner state, your inner attractiveness or less, not so much. In these words, he says, focus instead on a, a developing a gentle and quiet spirit. The word gentle translates a common Greek word that means meek. It's a powerful concept that Jesus used to describe himself in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus says, I am gentle. I am meek. Meekness has a bad rap in our culture. It comes across and many people think of as it means wimpiness. It means being a doormat. It means letting somebody take advantage of you. Just like we push back against the word submission. We push back against submission because we think it means being wimpy. Whereas I define meekness, I define gentleness as my power under God's control. So Christian wife, what that means is your lips, your eyes, your ears, you voluntarily put them under God's control. Your thoughts, your emotions, your actions, you put them under God's control. Your attitudes, your responses, your relationships, you put them under God's control. The gentle spirit is one where the Christian woman lives under the moment by moment leading of the Holy Spirit. That word quiet, it's partner. It's an unusual Greek word that means tranquil or undisturbed, like the surface of a lake on a windless afternoon. Boy, that's the best water skiing, isn't it? When you have no wind and it's totally glassy. Well, apply that to a spirit. Most of us are up and down. Most of us live conditional lives. We think if things are going well, we're having a good day. If things go badly, we're having a bad day. Depending on your opinion, you might think snow days are wonderful or terrible. But instead, if you focus on letting the spirit lead you and developing a gentle and quiet spirit within you, then you're not up and down because you trust in the Lord. You trust that God is in control. You trust in his providence. That's what we want to aim for. That's a much better way to live. So Christian wife. You want to have the best possible influence on your husband, on your kids. You focus on growing like Jesus in purity and reverence. You focus on developing a gentle and quiet spirit. There is power, there is value in that development of inner beauty. To wrap it up, to convict us even further, Peter says and gives us the example of inner beauty. He talk, turns our attention toward the women of the Old Testament. Verse 5, for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. What was that quality? They put their hope in God. They put their faith in God. This is what they wore, their faith and their trust in God. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. 
called him her Lord. That's a powerful word. Lord, master. It means to have a deep abiding respect. She submitted. She showed the way. Now, you look through Genesis, and I did this week. You read about Abraham and Sarah. You never see her directly call him master or Lord. The best I can tell, it comes from Genesis 18. But before we get to Genesis 18, I want to remind you, earlier in Genesis, it has God telling Abraham, yes, y'all are having trouble having a son. But I promise you, Abraham, you will have a son. And your descendants through his line will be more than the, sand, the grains of sand on the seashore, more than the stars in heaven. You're going to have a son. Now, Abraham was 75, and his wife was 65, Sarah. That was pretty old. 24 years passed. By we, the time we get to Genesis 18, Abraham is 99, and Sarah is 89. And we have three men come to visit. And one of them says, in Genesis 18, the one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. When she is 90, she will have a son. Abraham, you will be 100. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. And here's an understatement. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought. She doesn't say this out loud, but our inner thoughts are even more revealing than what we say out loud, aren't they? She thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord, my master, my husband is old, will I now have this pleasure? I tell you, this gives me great encouragement to read this story every time I do. Because Abraham and Sarah, they were not perfect people. They were human. They were flawed just like we are. You hopefully will set as your aim to strive for purity and reverence, to strive to have a gentle and quiet spirit, but you're not always going to make it. We see it over and over. Abraham lied not once but twice about Sarah, saying she was his sister instead of his wife. Sarah, right after these verses I just read to you, she laughs and God says to her, why'd you laugh? And she said, I didn't, she lied, I didn't laugh. Oh yeah, you did. They were flawed. Yet in Hebrews chapter 11, it commends both of them for their faith. And of Sarah, it says that she had faith to believe in the promise. She believed he who promised was faithful. Now scholars differ over whether that's she believed in God or she believed in Abraham. It could be both. She believed in God and in his providence that he'd had her married to Abraham and she was going to respect him. She was going to submit to him and trust in the will of God, even though it seemed impossible. It's a powerful statement. It helps us maybe to think about how we could possibly ever submit. How can you submit as a husband or a wife if your spouse doesn't believe in God or doesn't consider following faith important how do you submit you may not have caught it but in verse one it said wives in the same way submit yourselves and next week we'll talk about verse seven which says husbands in the same way in the same way points you to what came before what comes before three one the last part of first peter two if you were here last week I told you, verse 21 says that we are all to follow and strive to live out the example of Christ, to walk in his steps. And then verse 23 gave us the key of how possibly we could live lives of submission, even when it doesn't make sense. How we could possibly focus on showing our faith instead of nagging about our faith, telling about our faith. How we possibly could continue to stay living, living in and loving God, trusting God. Verse 23 says, when they had hurled their insults at him, that's Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he, Jesus, made no threats. Instead, he, Jesus, entrusted himself to him, God, who judges justly. The essence of faith is believing in the providence of God. In a marriage that's unequally yoked, 
the way you submit, the way you keep being as faithful and living out a Christian life in your marriage as you can is you trust God because he will reward you for the good you've done. God always evens it out in the end. God rewards, and if you plant good seeds, he brings up a good harvest. If you plant bad seeds, a bad harvest, bad consequences will unfold. That's how we do it. That's how we do it, is we seek to live emulating Jesus, him being our example. And in that, we live out that example. We live out that purity and reverence. We live out that gentle and quiet spirit. One last question. Was Jesus beautiful? Was Jesus beautiful? Not according to Isaiah 53, 2. Isaiah 53, 2 says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. I always laugh when I see all those pictures of Jesus, you know, those posters that are what I call GQ Jesus. You know, he has that long flowing hair and the long beard. He looks like a model. Well, this says his physical appearance was nothing special. That didn't account for his attractiveness. That didn't account for his godliness. It was the inside that made him beautiful. And I know this, he certainly wasn't physically beautiful when he'd been beaten and whipped and had a crown of thorns on him when he hung on a cross. But I say this, he was never more beautiful. Just as you who are faithful, even when challenged, even when tested, even when unequally yoked, you keep it up. You grow your inner beauty so that you're your most beautiful on the last day that you live and God will honor that and maybe even you'll bring a lot of others closer to him yourself father we thank you for this teaching it's hard to hear especially if it applies to us I'm sure there are some here who know this life I've been talking about whether a husband or wife, maybe their spouse is not on the same page. So Father, I lift up those folks and ask you to comfort them, to strengthen them, to encourage them with these words. But help us all to see this applies to us. All of us can focus on the outside or we can focus on the inside. Pray that you're changing us. You're growing us. You're bringing to us a gentle and quiet spirit. You're helping us to be pure. You're helping us to be reverent. We trust you, Lord, as you who judge justly. We want to be faithful. Help us be faithful. Help your spirit to lead us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's ministry time. If you want to become a Christian, we can help you with that. If you want to join us here formally, become a formal member of Northside, we can help you with that. If you have a decision, please come. Let's stand and sing, okay? Let's stand and worship.
praise our God in this place this morning. Amen. Yes, God, you are good. Thank you for your presence. So <clears throat> community groups, we're signing up. They start February the 9th. Uh, that is two weeks from today. Uh, that, we do those semesters, and it goes to about the middle of May. Uh, where I was telling the Connection Center on this side by the old coffee bar, that's where you can sign up uh, for connection or community groups, and folks will get with you, and uh, the leader will get with you and let you know the details. So we encourage you to do that. We also talk a lot around here about For the Berg. We think Jesus, when he said, love your neighbor as yourself, he meant it. And this is what we encourage folks to do is to practice intentional acts of kindness. And we want to guide you in that for February. We want our church wide to, to honor the people that deliver stuff to you, the postal carriers, the UPS driver, those FedEx, the, maybe leave them some cookies, a candy, a card. Just let them know you see them and you appreciate them. And uh, all those acts, as we multiply them, we leave and make a big impression on folks around us. So that's my encouragement to you. Also, we let the Super Bowl slip up on us. The Super Bowl, I mean S-O-U-P-E-R, and not the S-U-P-E-R. We all know about that one, right? We all know who's going to win that one. I mean, why even what? I mean, the, the Chiefs are going to win. That's what God told me. But listen, I, I've never got so much hate mail as saying last week that God doesn't care about football. I'm kidding. I haven't got hate mail, but I did get some people saying, what do you mean God doesn't care about football? Well, I don't think he does, but I still say go Chiefs. But back to what I was talking about, the Super Bowl. And we encourage you to bring cans of soup, maybe cases of soup that we're going to take to the Warrensburg Food Center. This time of year, it's great to have soup to feed yourself to those who are less fortunate. Bring cans of soup, bring cases of soup. If you don't have time to shop, if you just make a donation, make sure we know it's for the Super Bowl, for the community center, or the food center, then we will uh, go buy the soup and take it to them ourselves. We've got one week to do that, just till next week. So if you can help us out, catch us up. I know I expect a big north side push, like I always have seen you do. Uh, we'll bring cans of soup and we'll take that over for the Super Bowl. Good to have you with us today. I hope you enjoyed the day. I want to leave you with this. And uh, and this encouragement. You know, what I've talked about today <clears throat> is important for you to hear. There's only so much you can do with your genetic makeup. I mean, like, how handsome could I ever make this, right? But everybody, every one of us, every one of us can be beautiful on the inside. Every one of us can strive to be like Jesus. Let's stand. I'll pray for us. When I say amen, we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you.